people. I get 100 messages every day of beautiful messages saying I, I help people get off heroin or I inspire them to quit their job and pursue their own company. And it's really humbling. Humbling is the, the word that I keep finding myself using because I, I guess it just came, it birthed out of me following my intuition, which is not really me. It's, it's kind of like I tapped into a frequency and I've just doubled down and kept tapping into the frequency, kept tapping into the frequency and kept going back and saying, okay, it's like, it's not really me. It's, it's like, I'm just like channeling. What's up, everyone? And welcome back to another Mind and Heart opening conversation on Just Tap In. I'm your host, Emilio. And in today's episode, I had the pleasure of sitting down with the animator and creator behind the widely popular conscious education channel, After School. Many people may recognize After School from the colorful RSA animations on whiteboard videos that touch on society's most pressing topics and feature the world's greatest teachers such as Jordan Peterson, Alan Watts, Eckhart Tolle, and others. The creator, Mark Wooding, is a San Francisco native who began his art career before he could even talk. Mark started his career developing educational videos from top tier colleges like Yale and Stanford. Through his combined love for classic illustration with his fascination for film and editing, he founded After School, one of the largest conscious educational channels on YouTube with over 2 million subscribers. This conversation reveals behind the scenes stories on what it takes to revolutionize education on the internet, allowing the best ideas to win, developing creative discipline, leveraging suffering as a superpower, and how Mark Wooding is pioneering the future of online learning on YouTube. For more wisdom-packed conversations with true paradigm shifters that inspire you to tap into your genius, I invite you to subscribe to this channel and hit the like button on this video to help it get it shown to more people like you. And without further ado, the artist who is taking the internet by storm, Mark Wooding. Live, Mark Wooding, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Man, I don't know where to start. This is um, this is really an honor to be here with you. Uh, one of my favorite YouTube channels, After School. Many people might have heard about it right now. Congrats on passing two million subscribers the other day. That's huge, man. Um, big Thank congrats. You. And Thank I kind of so just wanted to to go back to like the birth of everything. And when I've been studying your your work and kind of your journey, I've seen there's there was like two inflection points that led up to the creation of After School. And one of them was you were a freelance animator for a while. You were making murals for Facebook headquarters, big companies, universities. And one time, um, a potential US president and presidential candidate came up to you and asked you to do an art piece uh, for like a campaign. And it was kind of against your morals. It wasn't, you know, you weren't really resonating with it, but you went through with it. And in the end, they didn't show it. They didn't show your art. And for you, that was like, oh my God, I need to do something that's aligned with myself, with my ikigai, with, um, I forget the, what is the word that you use. That's not ikigai, but uh, I have it. Uh, sweet spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's Your it's more the magnum opus. We'll magnum talk about opus, that. right. Yeah. Yeah. And and that was one inflection point. The other one that I was looking into was a heartbreak. And that kind of resonated a lot with me because the creation of this podcast was followed by a heartbreak and really channeling the creative energy towards something that, you know, you're really passionate about. And that's something that you you stood for and you went for it and you gave yourself one year to hit. 100,000 subscribers. What was going through your mind at that point? How did these inflection points correlate? What was the relationship? What was the impact that they had on your journey? Man, thanks for having me on. And, and you've definitely done your research. You, you pretty <laughs> much know my story already. Uh, I love I it. I guess yeah. what, I'm, what I'm getting from, from your interpretation of my story is that I'm just realizing that like every time I had a, a misstep or I got really uncomfortable or I encountered a failure, 
uh, for me, i never saw that as the end. I always said, okay, this is a learning moment. And Will Smith said it. I really like how Will Smith said it. He says, you fail forward. Hmm. So every time you fail, you want to, you don't want too much time to go between your failure. And then when you start up again, you want to like fail and then just learn and then just get started right, right away. So every time I, I had one door close, I kind of saw it almost as an opportunity to go, okay, you know, I'm like a river. Maybe that way is blocked, but let's see what other direction we can go. And now that I look back, I'm really thankful for all the, the rejections that I got. You know, I'm, I'm really happy that the girl rejected me in high school. Mm. You know, I'm thinking, man, what if she said, yes, I could have been in a trailer park somewhere with like six kids. Yeah. <laughs> but, <clears throat> so I'm very appreciative of, of all of the things that, that didn't go my way because I, I like to see them as, as just they're out of my control. So they're, they're signs. These are signs. Like if something that's perceivably negative happens, that's outside my control. That's a sign from the universe or the creator or whatever. Take that as a sign and learn from it and adapt. And it seems like the people that can adapt the quickest are the ones who are the most successful and make the most money. It's not necessarily the smartest person, the person with the highest IQ or that the most college accolades, but it's the people who can just adapt. They might not be you know, the smartest, but they, they end up in good situations and they're happy and they live fruitful lives. So from what I've seen. Hmm. Yeah. And, and one of the things with adaptability that I've seen that you talk about is uh, regarding the YouTube algorithm. And in the beginning, like you were making these, these videos that were super interesting, that they sparked like curiosity. Why don't country flags have purple in them? And, you know, these types of videos, they, ga- they engage a lot of people. But there was also a crossing point where you just decided to make videos for yourself, for your own self-realization, your own knowledge, your own curiosity. Walk us through kind of that journey from trying to quote unquote, like please what the algorithm wants or what people want to see and then making the art for you. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, so in the beginning, I, I was really just reaching in all different directions. And I kind of look at uh, YouTube as uh, your channel is, is like a hub and all the videos you make are roads that lead to your hub. And if you have a hit video that's getting a lot of views, that's like a big freeway that leads to your hub. Mm. So in the beginning, I, I had no subscribers. I wasn't making any money and I wasn't getting any views. So I was just trying to set roads in all different directions. And I was kind of reaching. I was like, okay, what do people want to see over here? All right, that didn't work. <clears throat> Let's make something that you know infiltrates this area. And uh, it was just a lot of experimentation. So I wasn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't find my groove yet. And uh, finally, I had a, I had a little bit of success from the algorithm, and it triggered, you know, new viewers to come in. And I'm like, oh wow, this is how the internet works. This, this is cool. Like, I don't have to just bug people on the street to subscribe. Uh, these are people that don't even know me that are subscribing on all parts of the world. Yeah. And uh, I tried to replicate that success. And the the thing about YouTube is it kind of I think it catches on to if you're doing the same thing over and over again. Like you'll have big success. And then you'll try to duplicate that same thing and you'll, you won't get a, it's a diminishing return. So if you just did the same format, the same length of video uploaded in the same time, if it's just the same old thing, you kind of gradually reduce. So I kind of like it about the algorithm. Actually, you, you're constantly having to keep push farther. Yeah. yeah. I, I, my girlfriend, she's a YouTuber as well, and mm-hmm. she's been uploading the same format videos, um, pretty much just talking videos about the same type of subjects. And she's seen her videos uh, doing that gradual reduction. So we both just had a conversation about, you know, maybe it's time to, to really shake things up. So uh, <clears throat> I did that with my, my last video. I was kind of seeing this gradual reduction, but then all of a sudden that last video on mass psychosis took off. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, you know, people want to see more of that. But if I just made videos of that type of t- topic, I think I'd see a gradual reduction too. So, Yeah, that's a good thing about the creative process because you need some sort of like restriction around, you know, you have a deadline, 
you know, the algorithm wants certain things, but it also makes you want to change your your creative process. One of the things that I really love about your art, and I'm I'm a person that's I'm not an artist as like as per se like a painter. I consider myself very creative, but I love seeing other people's art, and I like how you, you know, incorporate Alex Gray into your videos. And your art is so unique in the sense that you're literally filming a whiteboard, and you're painting um, with these uh, markers. And then you just speed up the video in real time. How did that idea, where did it come from? Um, did, were you doing that when you were little? Did you just, you know, see someone else do it and want to like do it your own way? How did that come about? Yeah, so I, I had been drawing since before I could even walk. I, I fortunately had parents that really encouraged me to be creative and they would, before I could even crawl or walk, they would throw down a, a pen on a paper and I would kind of slug my way over and, and grab it in a fist. And I just start scribbling. And the funny thing is I held my, my pen like a fist up until mm. like second or third grade. And all my teachers were trying to, to beat that out of me. <laughs> so I'm like this left-handed schooling fist you. pen holding kid. Uh, <clears throat> but I won this, I happened to win this really big art contest when I was only five years old. That was like this national big contest. Mm. I got this trophy that was taller than me. And and at that point I said, oh, wow. Okay. I guess maybe art's my thing. So in college, um, I'm sitting there in this class and they showed a whiteboard animation. This was pretty early on in YouTube. This was like 2009 maybe. Hmm. And, uh, I was just super captivated by the video and the drawings. And I remember the whole class that no, nobody looked down at the, nobody was talking. Everybody was watching this, this, it was called an RSA animation. I thought it was awesome. So then, uh, I remember I started recording myself painting and drawing. And, and one of the first paintings I ever recorded myself was a uh, Snoop Dogg speed art. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I, I just got really into like recording myself drawing. Cause it's almost more exciting to watch the creation unfold than to look at the final product sometimes. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times the, the art that I was creating wasn't even that permanent. You know, I do like a chalk drawing or it, it was going to, it was something that was going to be taken apart. So it was almost like the, the art lived on through that video. And then I didn't really care if somebody tore up the painting or whatever. Hmm. And so uh, <clears throat> I got a job after college uh, working for a, a hospital. And they asked me to do a video on uh, proper condom use. And I thought this is the perfect opportunity for me to use this art form. And, you know, instead of showing like actual people or fruits Mm -hmm. uh, this animation style was really kind of a cute way to show a topic that was kind of sensitive and, um, and it did really well. And it's the funny thing about videos is one video will lead to like five more videos because people, they kind of promote themselves. So yeah. that video did well. And then I got like five more requests to do videos and I kind of just stumbled into it. And then I started charging people for the videos and I was like, I can't believe people are paying for my art. And then the clients got bigger and bigger and bigger <clears throat> until you kind of know that that president story, which was like the breaking point where at that point I was just like, and for, for the listeners that don't know, um, I was asked in 2016 to do a video for uh, the presidential election for um, a campaign. And I'm really, I try as hard as I can to stay out of politics with my art because I just find both sides to be silly. I don't know. I don't want to get involved. I, it's, it's a type of energy that I, I don't, I don't want my art. I don't see my art being over there, hmm. but I, it was a paycheck and I'm, I was not in a position to say no to money. So I, I, I pushed aside my intuition. I said yes to money. And in the end, the, the job didn't, it, it fell apart. I did a lot of work and I didn't get paid. So that uncomfortable situation of, of basically being robbed pushed me into saying, okay, you know what? You, you pushed aside your intuition now it's time to listen to your intuition. And what's it telling you? It's telling you to just say no to these corporate jobs for a little bit and just pursue a path that follows your intuition. Hmm. I love that story. And I can tell like from what you're saying, that goes back even to like when you were a kid, when you're in school, uh, you know, you were holding the marker like this and they were trying to beat that out of you. They were trying to school you like, with a ch not with a k and you know one of the things that 
I get from you and your channel is that you really are into knowledge, education, like you're not against school. So this is like a new form of, of education. Uh, what I'm seeing, like last night I was just watching some of your videos with my parents. I'm like, you guys have to see this. And my dad stopped the video. My dad's kind of a logical person. And it was one of those, you know, one of those videos. <laughs> and he just said like, if people were taught like this, if kids were taught like this, it would be so much different, so much easier. And, you know, like when you look at your purpose through this channel, how much has it had to do with kind of revolutionizing education in a way? Well, I never thought of myself as much of an educator. Mm -hmm. I don't have a PhD or anything. Um, the funny thing is oftentimes industries will get revolutionized by an outsider, somebody who <clears throat> hasn't been in the field their whole life. They're does, they don't have a paradigm shift and, and suddenly change things. It's, it's like a kind of like a nomad on the outside. Hmm. Uh, I'm trying to think, I'm blanking on examples, but I, I guess I'm thinking of like Elon Musk, Yeah, I guess he, he, I don't think he was a, an auto mechanic his whole life. And then suddenly he was like, let's change cars. You know, he kind of came in from the outside and now every car company is like going electric. Yeah. So it took somebody from the outside to really revolutionize things. I don't, I don't see, I just kind of like see myself as, as a curious person. Mm. And I think a lot of us love to learn, but maybe we didn't like school because in one way or another, it kind of shut down some of that curiosity. So I, what I try to do is just combine all the, the ways of learning. Like some of us are audio learners, uh, visual, some learn through experience by doing things and some can read it. And mm. I kind of try to combine all those. Some I'm, I'm writing, you kind of feel like you're maybe even doing it when you see my hand drawing. So it, it's like a, you're just combining all the learning uh, styles into one. And, and hopefully it's just a very easily digestible piece of content. Yeah. And, I just and I'm kind of just learning as I go. Yeah. It's a learning process. And I kind of just wanted to quote um, someone that, you know, praised your videos and someone who's been featured a lot in your videos. His name is Dr. Bruce Lipton. We had him on the podcast for people that want to check it out. But he said at the end of one of your animations, he says, an animation represents millions of words, complexity of words put into the simplicity of images. That's how we learn. That's how human beings literally learn through images. And the more knowledge we have, the more power we have. So I just wanted to like quote his words because they're so true. Like what you're, what you're putting out through animations is distilling all these complex topics because the topics that you get into are very, very complex. Um, and the next thing I wanted to ask you is, where do you get the idea um, for the next video? Or, you know, we were when we're talking about the creative process, when you're thinking about, you know, I want to take this idea, this concept, uh, you, you take a lot of Joe Rogan clips from your, uh, into your animations, and Joe Rogan conversations are three hours long. How do you choose, like, the clip, the 10-minute clip that's going to resonate with people and that's going to, you know, that you feel called to animate? How does that process look like? <clears throat> well, sometimes, sometimes I write the script. I mm -hmm. probably write about 30% of the scripts myself. And then uh, maybe 30% are collaborations with other channels. And then 30% are like audio pieces that I get. I always have to get their permission before I, I do so. Uh, so when I, when I hear an audio clip, like I'm all day, I'm just listening to podcasts and speeches Same. and, you know, I'm trying to dig for the, the next, and I'm, I'm listening to people. I try to talk to people from all walks of life, from like a homeless person to a millionaire, to somebody in South Africa, to somebody in Thailand. Like I'm trying to, I feel like the more people that you talk to, the more you'll have, like you bring all these, each experience you have is like a node in a network. And then as an artist, you bring all those nodes together into one cohesive creation, you synthesize it together. Mm. And unfortunately, you know, I've, I've been victim of this. If you talk to people in your little circle and you only talk to them, you kind of only have one node and all your creations are from that one little node point of view. So it's, it's, I think it's important to 
it's, it's humbling. I often get humbled and then realize how little I actually do know when I'll, you know, I'll talk to a, a doctor and I'll be like, Oh, wow. I, I know nothing about medicine. I should not talk about it at all. And then hmm. I'll talk to like some person who's a farmer and he'll say, Oh, actually it's food. And I'm like, Oh, wow. Okay. Well, the doctor didn't know anything about this. That's crazy. And then I'll go back to the doctor and I'll bring up, have you heard this about the food? And I'm like, you know what? I didn't think about, you know, I'm just kind of yeah. bouncing between, and I, I wouldn't say I know a lot about any one particular subject, but I know a little bit about a lot of subjects. Hmm. And um, let's see, what was the other part of the question? I'm trying to, it was a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just going off that, um, I wanted to just highlight this quote that, that you said in another interview that says, it's funny how when you open one door of knowledge that leads to many other doors, I intend to open as many doors as I can in this life. And going back to you know the, the last question, when you're looking for these new ideas, you're opening doors, you know, you're, first of all, I'm gonna go into ancient civilizations and then you're gonna go into another door and then you're gonna go into geology. Like it's never ending. Like once you open that door of curiosity, you will never stop learning. You can, it's impossible because there's so much information out there in the world that once you start opening doors, you know, it's just rabbit holes after rabbit holes. That's kind of how I've experienced it in my own journey. And were you always this curious? I'm curious to ask. <laughs> you know, every time you ask me a question about like, where was I always this way? I, I immediately think about Bruce Lipton and his ideas on the subconscious. And like, mm. I go back to like, where did I get these subconscious programs from? Yeah. You know, that yeah. where he says that they were created from the age of zero to seven years old is when you're being programmed and you're, you're in the theta brainwave state. And yeah. then after seven, then you're now, your consciousness is kind of formed and it's very hard to, to change that. The only way you can change that is through repetition or hypnosis later on. Mm -hmm. So when you ask me these questions about my, my deep past, I'm like, huh, I wonder where I got that program from. But I do remember when I was very young, uh, I was not the best student. I was definitely not like an A, I was like a B plus student. But the one subject I really excelled at was uh, show and tell. Mm. I'm not like a great public speaker either. I, I don't even like to, to be like, I don't like the attention on me. That's why my face isn't on my channel. Mm. But I was really good at, at show and tell. And I, I remember I would spend the entire week getting my presentation ready and I'd have props and like all these visuals. And a, another kid would go before me and they'd say, this is my shoelace. It came off my shoe. It, it has mud on it. Okay. And then I'd come in with like all these like flasks and scientific equipment and like I'd light a fire and I'd put a boiling egg into a bottle and it would shoot out. Like all the students go, whoa, and I would barely even talk, but I do all these, like I had this big science book and it had all these experiments. And for a while, each week I would do an experiment in front of the class. And a lot of them involved like chemistry and high temperatures and you know, the teacher would be like, is this safe? And, but I do remember I, I would always get a big reaction out of the students. And I think in the yearbook, I won like best show and tell person and best artist. So wow, maybe that's where it came from. Yeah. I mean, we always have, and, and that reminds me of an idea from, from Robert Greene. Uh, he's author of 48 Laws of Power, Laws of Human Nature. And he, he talks that we, when we were younger, we have like these inc natural inclinations, and, you know, for some people that's music, for some people that's art, for some people that's, you know, maybe conversations or human connection. Um, and when you look back in school, you kind of get beat out that those natural inclinations until, you know, you're kind of expected to be a printout of all the other students around you. You get the same treatment, you get the same diploma, you all get the same. And it really creates this bubble of, you know, conformity. And so what you're really saying now is that you listen to that natural inclination that you had when you were a kid. You're holding markers this certain way. You wanted to show people through images, through symbols, through representations. And that's what you're doing now, which is incredible because not a lot of people go down that path. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's been fun, and I I'm very blessed, and I I feel very lucky. Uh, mm. I like to look at the past with a lot of gratitude, mm. uh, which is I guess 
somewhat rare nowadays because it's very easy to look back at the past and stand on this moral high ground and say, oh, everything in the past was terrible. Mm. But I, I'm super grateful for everything in my life, all even the, the good and the bad, and my ancestors before that, the good and the bad. I like to study history too. And, and it's, you know, even the worst things, I, I think, wow, after, after that horrible thing, this amazing thing was birthed. You know, the pendulum always swings. So I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm grateful in spite of suffering, as Jordan Peterson would say. Yeah. And, and talking about suffering, I wanted to highlight this stat that, that I heard you say in an interview when you were talking about like how much goes into creating a 10 minute video. And you said somewhere in between, I don't know if this is the same number now, but it's somewhere in between 100 and 300 hours that goes into creating a 10 minute video. You know, that, that really, um, you know, you need a lot of discipline, you need a lot of commitment, a lot of probably intrinsic motivation, because, you know, what you're doing now, it's, it's not an extrinsic motivator. Uh, same as with this podcast, like no sponsors on here yet, like nothing. We're just doing this because we love this. So I wanted to let that number sink in for people because we're in the era of, you know, quick short-term gains. You know, you make a, uh, a reel in five seconds, a TikTok in five seconds, and you can go viral tomorrow. So I I wanted to get into your mindset a little bit with with this, you know, dedication into how much work goes into a video. And if you can also highlight the, you know, the whole process behind it and how do you stay motivated or how do you stay there mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually to get to the end goal, which is, you know, finish the finish the video, um, how you how you maybe not how you expected it, but, you know, just getting it done pretty much. I think just getting better and, and seeing yourself having a, a goal and kind of seeing yourself get closer to that goal is, is the most exciting thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if, if I'm just kind of going through the motions and just running on autopilot and doing a video about a, a topic I've already covered, I'm, I'm kind of like not that motivated, but if it's something new and I'm, I'm really focusing on the art, and I'm pushing myself to make this better than the video before my, I always have this mantra. Like I want every video to be better than the one before. So I always want it. Like I look back at videos from two years ago and I kind of cringe because I'm like, Oh wow. Look, look how poor the video quality was. Look at, I didn't know how to edit at that part. Uh, the lighting was all bad. You know, the sound, like I'm always trying to improve and, and I'm not the first one that ever do a YouTube channel that's about education. So I'm always looking at other big education channels mm -hmm. and seeing what they're doing and, and not copying, but kind of stealing some of their, their, um, like I, I'm observing, uh, I think that channel in a nutshell, their German channel, uh, I think they're called like Chris Gestatt. Yeah. Yeah. Kutz, Kutz uh, Kart, yeah a weird name. <laughs> they're, they're a great channel. And I'm always kind of like, okay, how often are they uploading? How long are their videos? Are they uploading in 4k? Uh, I'm kind of observing these things with them and, and they have like 200 employees. I'm, I'm just like, it's me and, and one other guy mm -hmm. who's helping me. And, but we're, you know, we're, we're very, it's humbling and it's encouraging to look at people who've already done it and kind of try to emulate them a bit. Uh, yeah. And just getting closer and closer to a big goal is, is so exciting that this is, I, I, I often reference Jordan Peterson because he's motivated me a lot as well, <clears throat> but he says that suffering is inevitable. We're going to suffer whether we, we do nothing or we do something. So you might as well make your suffering mean something by suffering towards a greater goal. You know, if you just sit at home all day and watch Netflix and eat cake, you're still going to have negative thoughts. P your loved ones are still going to die and you're still going to eventually deteriorate and die yourself. So it's important to have these big goals and then you can suffer willingly to get to that goal. And then the suffering will at least mean something, you know, if you're, uh, training for a big fight, uh, and you're in the gym four hours a day, you have that big fight to train for. Mm. So there's, if you didn't have that big fight, you'd be like, why am I doing this? You know? Yeah. And you quote a lot, uh, Joe Rogan, when he talks about momentum and he relates 
to it uh, in the aspect of like the gym. But I wanted to talk about maybe this creative momentum. Uh, have you felt that your creativity has flowed to you easier the more you do something? Like with the repetition of each video does, because that's something in my journey that I've seen is I never considered myself a creative person, never. Like absolutely, I was always like athlete, basketball, that was it. And without even realizing that basketball is such a creative sport, like if you're playing point guard, you have to manage like what what play you're going to do next, who you're going to pass it to, which which is going to lead to a basket, so stuff like that. But when we're talking about creative momentum, I started every time I'm doing this podcast, every time I'm having a new conversation, I'm creating novelty in my brain and I'm creating new neural connections uh, and there's just moments where I feel that it's a flow state. It's, you know, I, I'll probably look at the clock right now and yeah, it's, it's already been 30 minutes and it's felt like 10 minutes. Um, time gets faster. I wanted to talk about how you've experienced the flow state, how, you know, if you're going into a video that takes hundred hours, it probably hasn't felt like hundred hours. Um, but, when you're tapping into that energy, how, is, how does it feel? How does it look like for you? So when you're, when you're playing basketball, let's say you take a thousand shots. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between that first shot that you take and the last shot? Repetition. You refine the process or. But you kind of, you kind of build a momentum. Yeah. While you're, like the first shot's really rigid, right? You're like, it like. Mm -hmm. Maybe you make it, but by the end, you're really loose. You got a sweat going and, and you're kind of in a flow and you're, you're really, you feel, you, you get a sense of where the basket is. You get a sense of where your positioning is to the basket and you kind of, mm. you, you, um, you hone in on it yeah. and it's very similar to creativity. You know, the first drawing I'll do, I'll almost warm up. Like it's for an exercise. Like I, I have to get a couple drawings out of my system, maybe like 10 little quick drawings. So the first one, if I'm drawing a human face, the first one will be very like, I'll focus on the eyes and it'll be very rigid and it won't have much emotion. And then in the second one, it'll be a little looser. And by the 10th ten, one, it's almost just like gestures, but it's very free flowing. And it looks to me, it looks a lot better. And, and I, I've, I've always preferred like energy through art rather than these like very rigid, like here's a pencil on a table. Everything looks exactly like a photograph. So uh, when I start a video, I, I feel like I'm kind of rigid in the beginning, even though I do warm up. Mm -hmm. And then by the end, I'm really flowing and I'm coming up with new ideas. So oftentimes in, in the beginning of a video, I'll almost default to like my best images from a video a long time ago. And I'm always like, oh, that's a re like people that watch, like my parents are like, you drew that image in another video. <laughs> uh, yeah. you, I don't, I think 99.999% of people don't notice that it, it's a very similar image to another video, but that almost kind of gets the gears going. Like when you go back to the gym and take a basketball shot, the first shot has to be kind of like a free throw almost before you go out and you're doing sky hooks. Mm. Um, Kareem, so, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I bet if you just started sculpting, maybe your first sculpture would be this like weird little bowl. But if you did that for, for 10 years, I'd, I'd come back, you'd have these amazing bowls with paintings and I don't know, it's cool stories on them. You take it really far. Yeah. So it's, it's the momentum. It's yeah. such, it's so important. The momentum. Um, I wanted to, you know, you're talking about like these recurring images in your, in your videos. And one that I've seen like just through like pattern recognition are these sacred geometries. Um, you draw the flower of a life, you draw the Metatron's cube, and you, you have a whole video explaining it, like where it came about. When you're drawing these sacred geometries, um, what do you feel? Because when you look at the image, it, it just gets you a different type of way. Like I've been, um, something that I recommend people is a technique by Dr. Joe Dispenza. And he recommends to, if you want to reprogram your subconscious, look at a kaleidoscope. Because the kaleidoscope is, you know, this merge between figures, shapes, colors. And that puts your mind in basically 
close to hypnosis, ho- close to trance. So if you're looking at that, and then the, the following thing you look at is, he calls it the mind movie. So you play out, you know, you can even edit like a 10 minute video, five minute video of what you want your desired life to look like. And with affirmations, uh, I want to be a best selling author, you know, I want to be the greatest artist on YouTube, stuff like that. And you look at it after the kaleidoscope and your mind is already so suggestible that you, your, your subconscious just accepts it because your conscious mind is not there saying like, this isn't real. You're like, you, you can't do this. Your conscious mind is out. It's just going directly into your subconscious. I feel like that is a similar feeling with sacred geometry. You could correct me if I'm wrong, but like, how do you feel, um, you know, when you relate sacred geometry to your, to your videos? Yeah. Sacred geometry is one of those topics that <clears throat> you learn about it and, and it's, it kind of blows your mind. It's like looking at the kaleidoscope and it, it changes your consciousness. And then you want to learn more. And, and the, it's like opening doors. The more you learn about it, the, the more you realize that there's, if this goes much deeper hmm. and it goes to ancient civilizations and it, it goes into geometry and math and proportions. <clears throat> so, and, and I find it to just be very beautiful my house is filled with sacred geometry. Every, like people think they're like, what is this shape? (laughs) Every book, every, my, my wall is covered. Um, and I almost find that it puts my body in this like harmony. It emits a frequency that my body, I I feel very at peace. Like people walk into my room, I have like tons of plants everywhere and they, they just like, Oh, I like, I like the feel in here. It's like a different energy. I'm like, right. Mm -hmm. And I'm very into like, exploring different states of consciousness and, and anything I, I'm, I'm aware of, 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 I just got into ice baths. I'm thinking about like, yeah. I just got into jumping into ice baths. Uh-huh. So I, I just did this yesterday and it, my friend was like, no, no, this, this, I can't do this. I can't do this. I'm like, here, you're getting this and you'll just tell me there's going to be, there's going to be a huge difference when you get out of here. And he got, he got, and he's like, no, no, I can't do this. I can't do and it, he's like, all right, I can do five minutes, maybe tops. And he's like, I, I'm like, how, he's like, how long has it been? I'm like, it's, it's only been three minutes. And he's like, no, no way. And he's, he's really like protesting. <laughs> and then, uh, at about probably about five minutes, six minutes, he really calmed down and he just became very Zen. And it's almost like, you can't even tell if the water is cold or not. It's just like, hmm. it's just a sensation and you, you really kind of numb out and there, you get about. 10 minutes in there where you're just, you're kind of comfortable. You're fine. You, you're, you're not like your body was adjusting and now it's, it's chilled out literally. Mm-hmm. And then probably 13, 14 minutes in you, you start to get cold. Like your internal body is like, I'm cold. Like I want to get out. Yeah. And then it's kind of a fight. I don't, I don't think you're supposed to go longer than 20 minutes, but I, I try to like after 15 minutes, it's a struggle. So, I've never done 15 minutes. I think, yeah, like oh, really? four, four or five has been, you know, my max. Uh, that's crazy. But the thing is you get out though, mm-hmm. like you, you're, you're, you're in pain, you're suffering, but you get out and, and then the sun's brighter, the, the birds are chirping, everything sound, everything just feels better. Your whole body is like, everything's deflamed. You can move and you're really appreciative of like just the sunlight and you feel your toes on, on the ground and you're like, oh they start to get less numb and uh, and then that lasts like the whole day so it's things like that that i'm really into like working out there's a huge difference between a day where i don't work out and a day that i do so you know almost if you're like feeling tired and and lazy just do like some push-ups or yoga and then sit back down you're like all right i'm ready to go you know yeah i mean so I kind of went off the rails in that answer. <laughs> no, no, it's I love it, man. I I love. Um, I don't know if you've looked into Wim Hof. Uh, if you're doing ice baths, that would make for a really great video. He calls it, he calls it the inner fire. So you know, you you tap into this inner source that we already have innately, and and it's the body responding to the external stress, and that has a lot to do with. Bruce Lipton and, you know, this work of 
epigenetics and there's just a lot of rabbit holes and I just recommend people to watch your videos that they'll understand a bit more like these concepts that we're that we're hitting but I wanted to get into now we were right before uh, recording you were telling me about an upcoming trip that you had with someone and I think it's really interesting what, what you're going to experience and what you're going to learn. So if you wanted to share a little bit about maybe how you came in contact with him or what are you guys going to study, explore, that's, that's a really fascinating topic too. So yeah, I'll be going on a trip with Randall Carlson. Uh, if you don't know him, I highly recommend checking out his talks on YouTube or his Joe Rogan podcasts are probably my favorite of all the Joe Rogan podcasts. Mm -hmm. This This guy is the real deal. He has so much knowledge on every topic. Now, some people, no knock on anybody, they have their one topic and then they kind of always talk about that one thing. Hmm. Randall Carlson can talk about it, literally anything for hours. And, and I'll, I'll just like, I just want to listen. And I almost kind of want to just like, it's almost like a podcast. You want to just keep them going. Yeah. But it, it's really cool to go to, to do these things in the field. So what uh, Randall and I have been doing, we've been going around to these different sites and looking at meteor crashes and the geology and, and flood sites. And it's, it's pretty amazing how, how much there is to see on this earth. And if you get into geology, the whole earth is like a museum. And uh, our earth is just covered in scars. And these scars tell stories. So, and some of these stories are, are extremely relevant to our story as humans. So uh, this next trip we're doing is up in Eastern Washington in a place called the Scablands. <clears throat> and it's, it's a very significant place for the, the end of the last ice age. Um, people like him and Graham Hancock have this uh, theory that a, a big meteor hit earth and that's what ended the last ice age. And in a very short span of time, the earth heated up a lot. And there was a massive amount of meltwater. This was um, between 12 and 13,000 years ago. And all that meltwater rushed through Washington. And when you kind of, you can just go on Google maps and look at Eastern Washington and see, it's very obvious when you see the patterns of water flow and uh, the magnitude of these patterns is mind blowing, like a like hundred times bigger than what we're seeing today, maybe a thousand times bigger. And um so that'd be cool just to you getting out in the field and looking at big geological sites. It makes you feel really small and insignificant in a, in a nice way. Hmm. You know, um, if you watch any news or read any articles, it's always like humans are destroying the earth and it's, it's the end of the world constantly. And it's our fault and going out there in the field, it, it kind of gives you this feeling that we're actually pretty insignificant and the earth is just going to keep spinning with or without us. It's, it's kind of a nice feeling because it, it makes you see that you're part of this greater story. So I, I love getting on the field. It's super exciting. For me, it's a bit hard to learn about these things just through online courses or, um, yeah, I, I'm somebody that I, it really benefits me to see these things. And I wasn't bored for one second on our first trip. And uh, I find myself, even on the most exciting uh, online course, I get really distracted. So hopefully um, kids will be able to learn in this format, you know, in the future because learning on zoom is tough. I mean, yeah, I see. I mean, thankfully for me, I only had the last couple of semesters of college uh, completely virtual. But when I see people who are still studying, I see my sister who's just entering senior year of high school, man, it's tough. You know, they say that, travel used to be the best means of education. I think that was another guest who's been on this podcast, Rolf Potts. Uh, he wrote the book Vagabonding and he kind of revolutionized this idea of the digital nomads and travel as, you know, getting out of your comfort zone. But right now it's like, how, how do we best learn when we're stuck at home and we can't travel? That's That's been a huge struggle. You said that the views on your YouTube videos skyrocketed during the quarantine because people are like looking for these new ways of getting, you know, their curiosity, uh, basically. Yeah. Like they're, they're fulfilling their need to, to learn. And we all have that need. It's in, innate in all of us. So 
when what would you say like if we were not able to travel at all like let's say for the next couple of years what would be your recommended form of, of education and how would that look like how would education look like for you the next couple of years boy hmm. that's quite a <laughs> long <clears throat> think, long pandemic <laughs> i think the first step would be to fight like hell to be able to travel yeah um that's another story i guess mm. uh yeah. if you can't travel well it's always like when one door closes maybe another one opens so for these poor students who have to work on on zoom and, and do everything on zoom we're thinking god that's that sucks but and maybe they're thinking that sucks too mm. but who knows what opportunities you know when one door closes for them maybe they'll create some company that's for zoom based learning I don't know. Um, so who knows where the, the pendulum will swing, but um, the darkness shall pass. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, you highlighted it perfectly. Just that, like looking for the opportunity when some doors get closed, like the reason I'm doing this, this podcast and interviewing like um, extraordinary people is because I said, fuck it. Like, I'm locked down. I'm in, you know, I was in Spain at the time. I was living with my ex-girlfriend and, you know, classes were not as demanding as before. A lot of, you know, you can just like, excuse me for saying this, you could just cheat on the exam. Like <laughs> you have your computer right there. You don't really have to pay attention in class. Um, but I was searching and seeking for a new way to school myself. Uh, and I think that's also why I resonate so much with, with your channel. And it's because I'm looking for other ways to educate myself. I know that college and university and high school, like, like that system of education is great, but sometimes we just close ourselves down to that's the only way that you'll learn. And some people think that right after they get this piece of paper, then their education is over and and like they just go into a job and, you know, pick up a bit more technical skills along the way. But their curiosity and their, you know, means of learning just stops. So it's really inspiring to see what you're doing. And also going back to the Randall Carlson story, um, it just highlights and it's inspiring to see that people who were once like our heroes and people who we once like admired through the internet, through these new forms of reaching out. Like I reached out to you on Instagram, on DMs. Uh, and, you know, we're ending up having a conversation, you know, maybe we'll go on a trip, you know, and you never know, like you never know where these relationships can lead to just by, you know, believing in yourself that you can actually reach and, ask for you for what you want which is another thing that um i think you learned from alan watts right and the best lessons learned in, in after school mm. was alan watts he said like just know what you want like what what it is that you want and then you know things will line up along the way to make that happen synchronicities um all of that stuff i think is it's super key that's pretty much the hardest question to answer though, is, is what, what do you want? Yeah. Because yeah. once you get it, you realize that's not what I want. Mm -hmm. And that question of what do I want is the same as the question of who are you? Mm -hmm. It's, it's the same thing to know what you want is to know who you are. And we're always changing. And it's always like, it's like this, it's like trying to wrap your hands around uh, the wind or something. It's always just out of your grasp. So it's, you know, you can never really know what you want, mm. but as Alan Watts says, there's not knowing what you want because you've never thought about it before. And then there's the not knowing what you want after you've thought about every single possibility. You've thought it through all the way to its limits. And then you say, I don't know. And that, I don't know, is kind of like letting go. So, and it, it's like freeing yourself. I, I love that. Yeah. Where would you say in that whole, like, wisdom are you at right now huh 
I'm not, that's a good question. Cause you know, it's really, it's really easy to cast judgment on others and your past self even, but it's very hard to see your own flaws and, and where you are exactly in your own journey mm-hmm. per se. So, I mean, I have to admit, I still, I still want, like, I see a, a life that I would, I would like, and I'm not there yet. Hmm. So I, but I, as Alan Watts says in that really f- famous talk, he says, you know, why you don't want, know what you want is put because you already have it. Hmm. Uh, and I like that too. So <clears throat> I, I can't complain about anything. You know, I'm doing this YouTube channel. I'm having a, a great impact on, on people. I get a hundred messages every day of beautiful messages saying I, I help people get off heroin or I inspire them to quit their job and pursue their own company. And it's really humbling. Humbling is the, the word that I keep finding myself using. Cause I'm like, this is, I guess it just came It birthed out of me following my intuition, which is not really me. It's, it's kind of like a, a channeled, I tapped into a frequency and I've just doubled down and kept tapping into the frequency, kept tapping into the frequency and kept going back and saying, okay, it's like, it's not really me. It's, it's like, I'm just like channeling from some, like, like when Bruce Lipton, the quote that he, that he did in my video, yeah. we recorded that at his house and he just went on this beautiful rant saying nice things about my channel. And I said, did you rehearse that? He's like, no, I just channeled it. I'm like, are you serious? Can you do that anytime you want? I'm like, he's like, yeah. So I said, can we do another take? And he just did another perfect take, but he said completely different things. Yeah. So it, clearly it wasn't a memorized thing, but it was like flawless talking. I'm like, so you really just tap into, he's like, it's not even me. It's, I'm just channeling it. I'm like, oh, okay. So I guess that's, I kind of see that when, when somebody is, is doing their magnum opus, they're, they're doing what they're kind of put on earth to do. They're, they're, they're expressing their talent and their gifts and their, all their, repetition their practice comes together like you see it when a a musician plays their best song and they're up on stage and their eyes are closed you're like wow they're they're just like it's like god flowing through them you know i love seeing that like when Messi scores a an amazing free kick i'm just like it's 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 like beautiful it's more beautiful than soccer it's like Uh it's like you're watching god some of these free kicks (laughs) yeah have you watched the movie soul um from pixar i did I loved it. They have that one scene where, you know, they're in this this realm and there's the people that are in their flow state and you just see them like in another dimension. Like they're literally like their body is here, like your body is here, but you know, your soul is getting tapped into from another place and you're just like channeling that. Like you, how how you said and there's there's different ways that I've seen people tap into that uh, in your life. And that, this is crazy because this is one of our ending questions, like on the podcast. I mean, we'll we'll start wrapping it up, but I also wanted just to make it now because it's 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 super aligned in your life. What what is it that allows you to tap in within and really channel all these messages, channel all this art, and put it out in the world in the in the best way possible? Tap in within. I like that name. Mm. I guess it's it's it probably channeled. curiosity. <laughs> yeah, you channeled it. <laughs> I, I guess it's probably curiosity and just saying yes to curiosity and then following your intuition. Because you never really regret when you follow your intuition. Though the, for me personally, I always regret the times when I didn't follow my intuition. I said, man, you know, why didn't I just listen to my the voice inside there? Why why did I shut that down? So luckily for me. I've learned that lesson many times when I was young and now I'm just saying yes, yes, yes to it a lot more. Yes to intuition. And that's led me to a place where, you know, if you follow that intuition, you're never going to be led, led to a place where you're, you're fully lost, Mm -hmm. you know? So I'm, I'm in a great place and I'm super grateful for it. And I'll, I'll keep following that intuition. Yeah. Everything is, is intuition. I think, and it's also a skill that, that you hone in the more you do it. Like, the more you say yes to your intuition, the universe is like, all right, you're nice. Like, you're on the right path. If you don't follow your intuition, you know, you might receive what you didn't want in the first place. But in the end, it's all a lesson. It's all, you know, this journey that we're on. 
uh, when I messaged you the first time, I told you a bit about like my story, how I ended up here. And you just said, like, we're all on the same journey, but we're all like in different, you know, different um, places in it. So I really, really like that. Um, I wanted to kind of start wrapping up with a question that came to me when you were talking about your art. And there's this podcast I really love, uh, the Tim Ferriss show, and he asked people um, sort of the billboard question, if you know what I'm talking about. And I wanted just to give it like a new twist. If there was like a billboard and you could draw anything on it, just instead of how Tim Ferriss says, like, what would it say? If you could draw anything on that billboard for potentially millions of people to see, what would you draw and why? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is, is my favorite drawing. And, and it's like, it's like this big arc in my mind and it's the tree of life and it's coming out of the earth. So I draw the tree of life and it's like as above, so below, and then you'd have the roots below. Hmm. And in this drawing that I'm kind of, I want to make this into a painting in the roots of the tree is a baby and the, the, the tree roots kind of turn into blood vessels and under the ground, there's all these artifacts and hidden records and skeletons. And then on, on the plane, there's like modern day life. There's little people like ants walking around and there's like pyramids and there's giant stone monoliths and things like that. And then up above in the tree, you start to get more formless and more into the astral plane mm. and the tree turns into like DNA and it kind of spreads out into these like godlike eyes that then spreads out into like planets and all sorts of galaxies and cool stuff. So I kind of like that. It's like as above, so below. And that's my representation of it. But that's probably what I put on a billboard. Yeah. W what does that mean to you as above, so below? Cause I've heard it before. Um, but some people might not have heard about what that really means or what is it, how does it interpreted by you? Well, it's kind of like looking at the geology and, and the landscape and feeling really small and just knowing your place in the universe. Like you're, you're infinitely huge and you're also infinitely small. I mean, just physically within you, you have like trillions of, of bacteria and cells and particles. They're all coming together to create you. It's literally like the entire universe within you. And then you look up and it's, it's so big. You couldn't ever, there's billions and billions of stars. And beyond that, there's trillions of things. And it's like, you're right in the middle of that. You're right in the middle of all that. So there's as much greater than us as there is lesser than us. And so it's like this, it's, it's like, you're a God, but you're also nothing here wow. as above. So below. Yeah, exactly. It's like also the concept of your inner world is a reflection of the outer world and like everything that we have within us is expressed outside and what's expressed outside is also it's it's a cr really really incredible concept um mark thank you so much for your wisdom today um keep you know keep putting out your message into the world i'm really excited for what's next uh for you if you could give our audience a bit of like um, guidance of where they can find you. And also if you have any upcoming new projects that you want to talk about, it would be really interesting to get a little sneak peek of what you're up to now. Yeah. So I'm always planning my videos out several months in advance. So I've got some that are probably going to come out towards Christmas that are in the very early stages of planning. Hmm. But uh, the one that's coming out next is about the secret history of LSD kind of all the MK ultra mind control experiments on that. So that'll be coming out in a week. And then I've been kind of trying to touch on some darker issues lately. Uh, I've been going light and then dark because as above, so below. Yeah. And uh, the, the dark videos have been performing really well, like that mass psychosis video. So I'm going to touch on another topic about how kind of the victim mindset leads to genocide or the fall of, democracy. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can like just shed a light on some of these, um, very serious issues too. And then, um, then there's a health video coming out with, uh, Dr. Shauna Swan, who was just on Joe Rogan. Mm. And that's kind of about, uh, infertility, 
the infertility crisis that that doesn't get talked about in the media at all. But um, if you look at fertility, it's been declining a lot. Sperm sperm rates, sperm count is going way down. Is that because Testosterone. of the, the radiation from our phones or from the environment or like not well, to spoil the video, is, not to spoil her the video. Her theory is that it's plastic. plastic. There's so much plastic and everything that it's, oh. it, it greatly affects our reproductive health, but I'm sure there's a whole, there's a lot of things that, that, that contribute to it. So that's kind of a video, you know, all you hear about is the beating of the drum of that world is overpopulated world's overpopulated and all our problems are because of too many humans, which, you know, that that's somebody's opinion that could be true, but we might not have the ability to even reproduce at some time. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a startling topic. And then I'll probably sandwich that between like a couple of nice positive videos. Yeah. So dark light, yeah, you can't cold. have one without the other. Like if you're only focused on positivity and love and gratitude and all that, you just block out a whole another aspect of the human experience, which also is there to be integrated. It's like the shadow of humanity that's there and we need to acknowledge it. We need to see it as it is. And then we can fully move into like these more evolved humans um, as Gary Zukov, he's he's talking about it in his new book the multi-sensorial uh, multi -sensorial humans um, that we're now creating that we can tap into that intuition tap into non-physical beings these guides that we have around us it's going to be a lot of evolution i think for our consciousness in the next couple of years so cool to be on this journey man <laughs> thanks for having me of course brother thank you